Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Engaging the Phenomenon. And uh, today we have a very special guest. Um, I, I like to call her the, the Mother Teresa of UFOs. <laughs> uh, no, she's such a sweetheart. And, um, you know, Leslie Kane, she, um, as everybody will know, contributed to the 2017 uh, New York Times article um, that, that kind of really broke this, this whole subject open with uh, Ralph Blumenthal and Helene Cooper. Um, so welcome, Leslie. Thanks, James. Good to be with you. Yeah, it's great to have you here. I really appreciate you spending time here and, and talking with everybody. And, you know, you've, you know, for people listening to this, you have been a contributor to the New York Times, uh, to the Boston Globe. Um, you wrote uh, the book UFOs, uh, generals, pilots, and, and government officials go on the record, which, you know, had a blurb from Michio Kaku and the forward was written by John Podesta, um, which is, which is pretty telling. And he also wrote the book Surviving Death. So um, for, for people listening, definitely go check out um, those books. You'll definitely appreciate them. And uh, also for people listening, we are actually hosting an event Saturday, December 3rd in New York City um, called An Inquiry into Anomalous Ex Experiences and the Phenomenon. And this is the second part in the series. And Leslie Kane, is participating in that with Ralph Blumenthal, Whitley Strieber, Sharon Hewitt, um, Rollette, and Christopher Mellon, and, and Jeffrey Kripal. So, uh, you know, thank you so much for, for participating in that event, Leslie. I think it's going to be fantastic. I'm so happy to be, be able to do it. And I, I agree it's going to be fantastic. I, the last one you guys did was wonderful. I was there on October 8th. And that's what really inspired me to you know, play a bigger role in the next one. And so I think it's going to be a great event with really great speakers. And yeah, you guys are doing a tremendous job. And it's wonderful to have something in New York because right. the East Coast of the United States doesn't usually get to have UFO conferences. So right in my, you know, I live in New York, so it's pretty great for me to have it be here. <laughs> right. Yeah, same here. And, you know, that's part of the, the reason why Jay and I decided to do this. It's like, you know, we live in New York and the New York City area, and there's never UFO conferences or events, especially serious ones. Um, so we decided that we have to do this, and I think it's been uh, very successful, and I think it's already had a great impact on the community, and it's the, the type of conversation that we would kind of like to see in, in the Uf, UFO field, or, you know, UAP field, and, 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 and beyond. Um, so, you know, we're very uh, uh, grateful that everybody is who, who is participating as a speaker is, is helping to make that happen. So, you know, thank you to you, Leslie, and, and everybody who's involved. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mentioned, I mentioned the book that you wrote, um, UFOs, you know, uh, generals, pilots, and government officials go on the record. And that, I mean, I remember, I remember when that book was first released, I saw it in Barnes and Noble, I picked it up and I was like, wow, this, this book is like stellar. There's like super credible sources in here, all talking about, um, you know, their knowledge of, of, you know, UFOs in a very serious way. And these are people that held very serious positions. So how did that book come about for you? Wow. Well, I, you know, I have been reporting on UFOs in the mainstream media for about 10 years when the book came out. So I, my first story was in the Boston Globe in the year 2000. <clears throat> and I just kept going and always was focused on mainstream media and the stories would go out on the wires and they get picked up all over the place. And then in 2007, I did this press conference with James Fox. I don't know if you remember that, but it was yeah. at the Washington Press Club. And we had all these, we had people fly in from all over the world. And we had a panel of maybe, I don't remember, 13 people or something like that. Um, lots of media. And um, it was at that conference that I thought, you know, some of, because a number, uh, the, the people at that conference were so amazing and so authoritative and yet so close to the issue. I mean, it, it wasn't just witnesses, but it was also investigators. And these were all, you know, pilots and generals and really, really credentialed people. And they they each had five minutes to speak. And I remember feeling, I mean, and I even, I remember I even helped them 
put together their speeches and we had to time them. We were very organized about it, James and I. And I remember thinking, you know, these people have so much to say. And so that's what inspired me to try to do a book where I would incorporate longer bits from these, these people as starters and some others. And so what I did was I put together this book image. I mean, I wrote, I wrote the book, but interspersed it was with chapters actually written by some of these people. So for instance, General Jafari, who was the Iranian pilot who tried to shoot down a UFO, he had five minutes to talk at, at this press conference about this dramatic story. And yet in my book, he wrote a whole chapter in his own words about what happened and how he felt and what he saw and what happened next and what the role of the Americans was and all of the stuff that you'd want to know about. So I think a lot of the power of that book had to do with those chapters. I mean, there was something like three or four generals who wrote chapters in my book. And then there's one by Fife Symington, the former governor of Arizona, and of course, the John Podesta. And so it was, um, yeah, it was really, really exciting when that book came out. That's kind of what led to the book. And it did become a New York Times bestseller. And it got a lot of media coverage because I don't, a book like that had never come out before. Nowadays, it's not such a big deal. But then in 2010, when we were still fighting the stigma, like, you know, it was still totally entrenched um, and people didn't even get that UFOs were real, you know, which was really the theme of my book. If you had to put three words, UFOs are real and we need to study them. You know, it's like now we've arrived at that place, but then it was like a radical thing to put that out. And yet the mainstream realized there was nothing they could argue with in that book. That's the thing. I mean, everything was, incredibly well documented and the chapters by these very authoritative people made it impossible to just say, oh, they're all hoaxes or they're making it up or whatever, you know? So it, it, um, it kind of, uh, took, it grabbed the attention of the media and I'm really glad. I think it served a very useful purpose. Yeah. I still think it's a, it's almost like a gold standard of, of UFO books. I think that like anybody being introduced to the subject needs to read that book. And even if you've been in the subject and you haven't read that book, you need to, because if you're ever trying to put into context a conversation with somebody that's new to the subject, there's, I mean, any, anything from that book you can use as, you know, a, a great kind of guideline of the kind of conversation you should have with somebody if they're just getting into this, because it's just solid information. Um, it's exciting because to hear, a, hear, hear Pavar, um, the Iranian general, for one, or another pilot describe in their own words what they saw is incredible. It's not just me telling what they said, you know. So it's really, it's riveting reading. It's really exciting. And uh, um, I was going to say something else, but now I forget what it was um, about. Oh, yeah, I think the book is also good for someone to show to a skeptic. Right. It's great for people who don't know much about the topic. It's also great for a skeptic because I don't think any skeptic can read through that whole book and come out of it and deny the reality of this. There's just no way they can dismiss every single case and every bit of data that's in that book. I think most of them don't read it. But yeah. if anybody has a friend who's like, deeply skeptical and just says it's all bunk. I mean, this is this is a very solid way for them, I think, to to have to face the reality of it. Um, it's yeah. just, just part of my reason for wanting to write it. Have you, have you ever considered doing a, a follow up to that, especially now with everything going on? I mean, I would love to see you do it <laughs> with like, you know. There's so many. I mean, Russ Coolhart just came out with a book and I, I've been more focused on doing documentaries and series. And I've got the CNN series that I worked on that's going to be coming out next year or so. I don't know. I just I mean, it takes so long to write a book that by the time I finished it, it would be obsolete. Anyway, there's so much going yeah, on. I know that's like the problem with like it's so different now. I mean, even even on a month to month basis, there's like new information you have to add. So it's exactly. You know, but Ross Coulthard's book, In Plain Sight, was a fantastic book, too. So anybody watching this or listening to this on the podcast, that's another book, In Plain Sight, that's a great companion and almost like a follow-up in a way because it touches on some of the newer stuff that's happened since, um, but also goes back in time a bit and goes over historical cases. Um, so, you know, again, that was a fantastic book. And, you know, here we are now. That... Did, did that book, I guess, in, in a way, um, you know, you were very involved in the 2000s and 
leading up to the 2017 article. Um, so how, how did that, the 2017 article come about? Well, that came about because um, I was approached and invited to a meeting in October, on October 4th of 2017 to meet Lou Elizondo. And it was literally the day that he resigned. Um, and Chris Mellon invited me to that meeting. I think that's known now. And also present was Hal Putoff and Jim Semivan. And um, I spent about three hours talking to Lou about the ATIP, basically. And I was shown all the documentation. A lot of it has since been released, but not all of it, um, including you know, the, the, the famous letter from Harry Reid that's now been released. Um, I was shown the videos. I was shown a Lou's resignation letter to the Secretary of Defense um, and other stuff. It was just mind blowing for me. I mean, I had no idea that there was this secret program there. And um, to sit face, face to face opposite Lou for that long and talk to him and get to know him at a time when he was very vulnerable and, and really taking a big risk and didn't know what was gonna happen to him. You know, I mean, he was joining To The Stars Academy, but he was still really nervous about possible repercussions. And, you know, here, here he was giving up this career he had at the Defense Department. And it was just a really big moment for him and a scary time for him. Um, so after I was, shown all that you know I real I wasn't allowed to walk away with it but I'd seen it all and I knew that this was a possible story for the New York Times so I went to my colleague Ralph Blumenthal who was a, who is a freelancer you know he's on is a freelancer regular contributor to the Times and he's he's been interested in this topic for years that's how I'd gotten to know him I uh, was researching his book on John Matt for many many years and still was at that time I don't remember what year that book came out but um so he, he, I told him all about everything and he, he wrote a pitch to the, the lead editor at the Times who he knew. I think it was the head of the editor, you know, the whole top of the line editor there. Um, and then, you know, he was intrigued. And so we got to have a meeting with a very high level person from the Washington Bureau in Washington who was in New York. His name's Mark Mazzetti, he's head of the investigations department in Washington. And we just sat down at the New York Times building headquarters in New York and just laid everything out for him. And he was intrigued because we had people on the record and we had documents, you know, this is nothing, there were no anonymous sources or nothing ambiguous about this at all. It was very concrete. It was very well documented. And um, he took it back to Washington. And then a week later, we got the green light to do the story. And uh, we were told that Helene Cooper would join us, which was an incredible gift to us. My God, she was like this Pulitzer Prize winning, you know, top of the line Department of Defense correspondent for the New York Times. So to be able to work with her was just what a gift. So that's how it all started. Um, and then we just spent a couple months putting the story together. And the big moment was when Helene flew out to Nevada to interview Harry Reid. Uh, and we, you know, we were on the cell phone constantly and it was, she was, you know, we were nervous about it. We didn't know what he was going to say, if he would say anything, but he was willing to talk to her, but, and we kind of knew that the horror story really hinged on having him on the record. I don't know. It would have, it just, we needed him to carry that story. And he, she went and sat down with him and he told her everything. I mean, everything about the program and his role in it and the funding of it and all the stuff that the Times wanted to know about, you know, how the program was started, what the role, his role was in it and all the stuff that has since come out. So when we nailed, when we had that, I remember Helene talking to her right after that interview, you know, we nailed it. We've got it. We've got it now. That was it. Then we knew we had the story. Um, so it was really exciting. <laughs> it was really exciting. It was yeah. I'll never that, that, that time. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot, so a lot of gratitude to the late Senator Harry Reid, who has since passed and and really left a great, um, you know, landmark or, or footprint down in, in this field. And I think the world really, because uh, in, in my opinion, this is definitely going down in history if it has not already and everything that's going on. Yeah, he has, he's been tremendous. And he I talked to him many times since then, and he's helped with other stories I did and he was, and I actually got to meet him in person finally, you know, about, I guess it was maybe six months before he died or something yeah. um, at his home. So he's just an absolutely amazing person. So right. 
Yeah, and he, he ended up writing that that brief chapter for the um, skin markers in the Pentagon book, I think, which was um, was important and fascinating that he did so. Um, but you know, after that, so the, the New York Times, or you know, the New York Times, you and Ralph wrote some follow up stories for the mm -hmm. New York Times, and so, I mean, all of them were very important. But I, you know, the one. I, I, I'm forgetting the exact year, but the one with that was talking about the off-world vehicles and the briefing that occurred, and you know, the the, the quote from Eric Davis about off-world vehicles. So right, how July did that? 20, July of 2020. Okay, okay. 2020. Yeah. yeah. So the, how did that? How did that story come about? I think it was coinc was it co coincided with with I think an announcement about the um, UAP task force, as I recall. I forget half right, the first right. story was all about that. Right. Yeah. And um, we wanted our story to be about crash retrievals, but you know, it was really the first half had to be all about the UAP task force. Okay, that's fine. Uh, and so I don't. We we had just been digging into this for a while, Ralph and I. Um, and I felt like we had collected a lot of information, and we just pitched it, and they they went for it. Although that was the most difficult story of all of the stories we did, and the editing was fierce and there was a lot of additional information we had that we could not include in the article for various reasons because of the opinions of the editors and so on and we didn't have a lot of space and so at least we got something in the times on you know establishing some kind of authority or reality for crash retrievals but um it wasn't definitive by any means and you know we felt like we could have done more with that, but I'm very happy we were able to do it, so. Yeah, well, and, and that's the, the matter of fact is that you did do it. You guys got it in there. And I mean, I thought it was it was incredible that, that, you know, even though there was probably a lot more that you could have added and, you know, some that might have been taken out by the editors, that just getting that in there and, and, and getting Eric Davis's quote in there, um, was a, a tremendous job. So, we're, you know, I think the community is greatly appreciative for that. Um, but speaking of the, the crash retrieval idea or reality, however you want to frame it, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's something that's kind of involved with all that. And that's something that's known today as the, the Eric Wilson uh, or the, the, the Davis Wilson notes, um, EW D notes where, you know, allegedly Eric Davis had this meeting with, um, Admiral Tom Wilson, and there was a document or a memo kind of summarizing what their meeting was like. So that the alleged meeting took place in 2002, October 2002, and the, the notes didn't make it out into the public uh, realm really until about 2019, early 2019, I believe. So what was your first encounter with the, the, the um, Wilson Davis notes? Well, I was shown the notes in July of 2008. Um, and I was at a UFO conference in San Jose, California that summer. And um, a, um, a, a person that I knew who had access to the notes, who was sort of part of the whole world of, you know, um, the insiders at the time. I'm not going to say who it is because I don't have his permission to do that. He might not mind, but I'm not. I don't. I haven't asked. Um, but he had the notes, and he came up, and I knew him already. He was at this conference, and he came out, and he said, "I want to show you something, and let's go out." And we went out into the parking lot. I remember, and sat in his car, and he allowed me to read them and take notes but obviously not take a copy with me, but I was able to read the whole memo and take a lot of notes on it. I still have those notes in my file, you know, back from that day and the yellow pad. Um, and uh, yeah, that was when I first saw them. I never exposed them or talked about them to anyone. Um, and they blew, you know, they were mind blowing to me, of course. Uh, and I remember trying to track down some of the names and some of the facilities that were mentioned. And it was just like impossible to really get anywhere with as a journalist, and especially as a journalist not associated with any particular newspaper. I was just independent, you know. 
I couldn't get anywhere in terms of trying to get somebody to talk to me. I did get some questions answered and I got more information from the source of mine that gave me, the, that showed it to me, that, be, that went beyond what was in the document um, about some of the players that were involved, which was really interesting too. But I, you know, there's nothing I can do with it except keep it in my files. Um, but it was really a, a big moment to yeah. understand that there, there was likely, you know, I, I had no reason to doubt this, that it was real. And um, then years later, I met Eric. It wasn't, a, I didn't even know Eric at the time. I, I don't remember when I first met him, but it was at, um, in in Austin at Hal Putoff's Earth, Earth, Earth Tech, I think it was called, yeah. when, when he worked yeah. with Hal there. And I think I had talked to him on the phone, but we, we spent some hours together and, after getting to know Eric, and I'm sure you know this too, and having talked to him for hours and hours and hours on the phone, he has this kind of encyclopedic memory, you know, because I used to wonder, well, if he didn't tape this meeting with Wilson, how could he remember all the details were in that memo to write it down afterwards? And after knowing Eric, I, I understand how he could have done that because, he, and you may, you probably know this, I mean, his mind is like, he can go back years and years to some meeting and tell you every detail of exactly where it was and what time he left his hotel and when he arrived and what people were wearing and who exactly was there and who wasn't there. I mean, he's got this unbelievable memory. And so um, that to me, when I got to know him kind of, re and, and also I got to know him well enough to know that he wasn't going to make up something like this, that it was real. And I'm yeah. convinced, that, you know, um, and so, yeah, so it all fell together, you know. And I think it's a really important document, but whether we will ever get, you know, any kind of verification for it, for any of it, I don't think Admiral Wilson's going to be the one to provide that. So um, we'll see whether we'll ever get that. Yeah, and I, an interesting note with that is is that Richard yeah. Dolan was shown the notes around the same time, um, at you know, presumably a different meeting and event, and. The person that had shown Richard Dolan the notes was was part of the NIDS kind of group, um, uh, which would seem to be a different person than who showed you um, the notes. So it it seems that you know the NIDS group, a few people in that network had this this um, memo, you know, back in the early or the, the late two thousands, you know, prior to two thousand ten, and and many you know, a decade a decade and more prior to when they were released on the internet so again i think that's another strong cooperating point and now we've seen that they've been put into the public record you know through the the, the, the hearing that occurred which is incredible i had not even expected that to happen and you know sure enough it's there and um from what i understand um somebody had given um Giuliano Marikovic his the 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 research he had done on that which was called the forsaken uh, poison was handed off to to Senator Gillibrand so and and she said she was going to look into it so I that's another I think pretty incredible development in that because I think she, you know she was saying that she wants to follow up on all the information involved the name so you know who knows who knows what will happen again uh Admiral Wilson, and I, I don't blame him, um, has been very, you know, adamant that he was he did not participate in this, um, you know. But we know that the, the meeting happened back into in 1997 with Ed Mitchell, and um, and uh, you know Stephen Greer was there, Edgar Mitchell, and uh, they did meet with Wilson, um, and then of course uh, Commander Will Miller was there and also confirmed that that meeting happened. Miller, uh, just, you know, allegedly set the meeting up, and Admiral Wilson was, you know, despite saying that he wasn't interested, I had actually found a 1995 uh, correspondence between Will Miller and, and Admiral Wilson, and it referenced this issue, and you know, having the briefing on it. So, from 1995 to the and the meeting happened 97. There's a two year period of interest that Wilson had at least, whether he's going to acknowledge it publicly or not, in mm -hmm. this issue. Um, so that's I, I mean I think that speaks for itself. And then again, 
we have the issue of Bob McGuire seeing a handwritten letter um, from, from somebody in the defense and intelligence world. And the letter was from Admiral Tom Wilson talking about how the meeting happened and it mentioned Eric Davis and it mentioned that he was not able to penetrate the programs the way he wanted to and he was extremely frustrated about it and that all that is is within the context of the notes so and just yeah. another interesting data point there but that letter has, has not surfaced correct i been shown to anybody so it's one person's account and that, and that doesn't you know it's just yeah i know yeah so i mean not, i'm not saying i don't trust him but i'm saying in terms of it being a story you know you gotta actually have that letter is there any way that that could become a, a story if if like what what kind of information would be needed for that to be like a new york times or or any story really well i mean if there was a, a letter that could be verified as to who wrote it and it was establishing the you know something about admiral listen having met with eric davis you know that's significant because he denies he ever met with eric davis so you know if there's something that contradicts that that's really really significant yeah uh, yeah for sure and and again i think it's it was an important step forward that oak shannon um you know put on the record that he you know he was able to you know eric wilson did ask him about eric davis and that whole thing happened uh, I think that's important because Eric Davis, I mean, uh, Wilson had said, oh, I don't, I don't know who Eric is, but, you know, clearly Oak knows that it's not the case. Right. So, and, and again, if, you know, Ad, Admiral, you know, Vice Admiral Tom Wilson may have super important reasons for not being able to talk about this. And I guess we have to respect that um, because, you know, he was very deep into the um, military industrial complex and, if, if the notes are correct, then he was, you know, encouraged to, to not talk about it. He might have good reason. Um, violating some kind of security oath of his own to even have that meeting. Right. Yeah. So there could be implications to that. Um, so, you know, God, God bless him. <laughs> um, so in, in regards to... Um, the the crash retrieval story you know james fox recently came out with a documentary called moment of contact and it's talking about this um brazilian crash retrieval case uh, di um did you have any thoughts on that case i mean i'm fascinated by the case i haven't seen the the movie i've seen i saw an earlier version of the movie because i was james would consult consulted with me along the whole journey that he went through with that movie and i haven't seen the final one but i'm going to watch it but I'm fascinated by it. Uh, how can you not yeah. be? I mean, it's more of a story about creatures than it really is about the crash. But if, you know, if you can connect the crash to the creatures, then you've got the connection to that. It's not just some weird creature from Earth or something, you know. If it's yeah. connected to a crash, so yeah. I mean, I just hope I've been following all this the, the stuff that pacchini has been saying the last couple of days. Um, I don't know where this idea he said he said it's going to be on the front page of the New York Times. I just want to let everybody know that I don't know where that message came from, um, but it didn't come from the New York Times or anybody associated with it. So, yeah. Uh, and um, I just I just hope that more comes out. I'm as excited as everybody else to see if our, you know if the videos or photos can ever be brought forward. I I think it's going to be difficult for for somebody to bring them forward. I don't know if they ever will be seen, but I really, James seems pretty certain that they will. And he's the guy, he's the go-to guy in that case. So, you know, there's a lot of risk involved too for these people, incredible risk. Uh, so it's just, it could be really incredible if there's definitive proof that these creatures existed, you know, which a lot of, you know, the authority, I think the status quo would not feel that we have that yet. You know, a bunch of testimonies isn't enough um yeah I mean, more we need the videos we need we need you know medical records or something something more than what we've got and if that can happen that can be paradigm shifting it can be really really important 
So, you know, but I have no special insight into it. I'm just like everyone else waiting to see what happens, you know? Yeah. And again, yeah, like you said, that would be kind of like the the holy grail or the crown jewel. And, you know, just for people listening, um, we are planning, uh, you know, a few other researchers and myself, a crash retrieval week. And, you know, some of us are going to be for a whole week, we're going to be putting out um, content and information on some crash retrieval um, cases. And, you know, that's going to be going to be the theme, the focus for the week. So that's going to be coming next month. Uh, So stay tuned for that. And I know there's a number of us who are going to be on a panel for that. And I think that's going to be really interesting. And I think that, um, you know, James Fox's new movie, Moment of Contact, is very relevant in that conversation because there are living witnesses, because it was only in 1996. Uh, that's not very far away. And, you know, there, you know, James Fox built a very great case for that film. And I think, um, again, if there's a potential for any further information to be released on that, you know, pictures, videos, or medical records or anything, that'd be incredible. Um, so, you know, speaking of, of crash retrievals, you know, in the new intelligence bill for 2023, the language is, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it, it's very explicit and refined language and, you know, it includes you know, going back to 1947, and it includes, you know, talk about materials and, and transfer of materials to national laboratories, biological effects. What are your thoughts on some of some of that new language that was drafted? Yeah, I mean, I think it's exciting. I think the most important thing in my mind is protection for whistleblowers, protection for people who want to come forward, who who have been part of these programs. Um, I, you know, I think um some of the going back through the legacy go, go, going back to be, you know the earlier programs involving the air force and i think it could be a little messy to try to dig up a lot of stuff before let's say let's just use 2004 as a date in which you know we got the nimitz case and we're sort of in the modern a sort of different era of stuff there and we had the osap program starting three years later um i sort of see that as a a line. And I think, I mean, the risk about trying to dig up a lot of stuff from the 50s and 60s and 70s, in my mind, is that the Air Force, you know, they're going to be people worried about being about recriminations and and de- things they might have done that appear to be really bad things, but that they really believe they were doing for the right reasons. And it, it just gets very messy. And I hope that that kind of stuff wouldn't slow the process down and wouldn't even make members of the Air Force just try to shut it down. Um, So to me, what seems most important to me is to focus on more of the recent developments to get people who 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 can come forward and talk about programs that they're in now or have been in very recently, maybe involving physical materials or crash retrievals or, you know, things like that. but um, I think that would be the most beneficial thing. I'm just worried about, you know, too much sort of getting back at people who may have tried to cover it up or have done things that were harmful to people as just um, risky because it might yeah. slow the process down. And it, it's just so messy and so complicated. And um, yeah, I, I had a similar I was speaking to somebody that was, um, you know, potentially knowledgeable in that in that kind of area, and they had the same kind of feeling, you know, about the legacy programs and 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 you know everything coming out now, and and they've they've been especially careful themselves, and are kind of along the same lines as what you're saying. You know, you got to really we're in un, an unprecedented situation. And it's, you know, nobody knows what's going to happen. And it's, it's really, um, you know, everybody's walking on ice, basically. True. And there's, it's so sensitive and complex. And I right. talk to a lot of people off the record and I know, what, you know, there's just the unbelievable issues that are going on and different, different approaches and different opinions and people that want things and don't want things. And, oh, it's just so complicated. And so, 
I mean, I, as much as we all can look at the Air Force and say, oh, my God, they covered this up and they were horrible to the witnesses and ridiculing people and, and worse, um, you know, whether it's useful to dredge all that up, I don't know. And I think that a lot of those people really did believe that they were doing, they were serving their country by doing that. And they had national security issues they were trying to protect, you know, and for all kinds of reasons. So I don't know. I would love to see a clean something start from 2004, kind of move forward and let the let the let the issues before that rest, at least for now. You know, yeah. until, yeah. until we've really gotten a long way with with more current information, I would I would rather see all that old stuff just left alone for now. But that's just my sense of it. And it's also from talking to people who have that same view. Um, but I'm, I am very excited about people who have wanted to talk about this, who have been sitting on these, these knowledge and experiences they've had, uh, people with clearances, you know, who can't talk, uh, to be able to finally speak to members of Congress about what happened to them, I think is really important. And they will go through a process and they're not just going to be able to sort of dump everything out, you know, through a journalist or on the internet or something. They will go through a process with members of Congress in which everything will go to them first. And then it will be able, they will be able to determine what's, what's safe for them to talk about and what isn't. Because we still do have national security issues that have to be protected. There still will be information that there's good reason why we don't want our adversaries to have it, you know? And I think, so it's a matter of finding that balance between what's okay for them to say and what isn't. And I know that they will go through a process in which that can all be sorted out. Um, and hopefully that's what'll happen. And then yeah. it'll come out. It'll come out publicly or it'll be hearings or whatever form it'll happen. I don't know, but it'll be a process and it'll take a little while. But yeah. I think it's really exciting. Really exciting. What is what is your read on, and I know this is a major concern for everybody, Right, and he, I, and no matter what, we want it all to happen. Uh, but what what's your read on, say, the, the individuals who do have access, knowledge, and clearance, and experience with this issue firsthand, um, having a closed door briefing, and then the concern is what what will make it to the public conversation? Do you have a read on how far that it's possible for that to be? Uh, public? Like I mean, public hopefully, I would hope that, and, you know, I'd want to believe that the members of Congress involved in those two committees, in the Senate and in the House, um, really do want to bring forward information that, that they can bring forward. They, and um, so I would, I would just, I don't know, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be that there's going to be some cover up that's going to be taking place again within the, these the chambers of Congress. I just think they have to be very careful about what they can. And so so let's say it let's say it might be sort of like the gimbal video, right? We know that there were there was more to that video. And 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 some and we didn't get to see it because assumedly it had some kind of stuff on it that would have been a national security risk. Or there are other videos that they feel they can't release. I mean I'm not trying to defend this. I'm sure there's lots of information that could come out and would not be a problem, you know, on a yeah. national security level. But I, you know, I just respect the need to be very careful about what does and does doesn't come out. Um, you know, if our adversaries were able to develop this technology before we do, we could be in trouble. And yeah. you know, that's that's a the hard fact that we have to all respect, I think. Um, when it comes to the unfolding of this information, as much as we all want to know, as much as we possibly can, you know, we have to be careful at the same time. This is dangerous stuff. You know, I mean, the power of the, of the technology is, we don't even understand, you know, we can't even imagine, right, what it would be like to be in the possession of a, of a country to be able to do what we see these things do. So we've got to be careful about it. and. I just, I just hope that there'll be plenty that will come out that might establish, it might be disclosure, it might establish the reality of this phenomenon, that there is a non-human intelligence here and that it is powerful and all the things that we all kind of already know, but we want to see acknowledged officially. I can imagine that happening without a lot of this sort of technical stuff 
and the stuff about the kind of, sen you know, the sensory equipment we use or whatever else we don't want our adversaries to have. I hopefully they can be separated and that yeah. we'll still get a lot of really interesting information. That's, I think that's what everybody, but nobody would want us to get in trouble by releasing stuff that we shouldn't release. Yeah. Well, and, and again, I'm optimistic on, on, and from what I've heard and, and again, I think too, it's not, it's not, this is, it's, this is the beginning or a potential new beginning to make those kind of acknowledgements. And I think that within itself would do a lot of good, um, you know, for the general public, for the United States, even uh, to stay ahead of the curve, I think is actually at this point within their best interest uh, to make that clean slate and say, okay, you know, this, this much, this is real. This is what we can tell you. And obviously there is still national security. So we, we can't tell you everything, but, you know, in good faith kind of thing, um, this, this is a genuine real phenomenon and there is technology involved and, uh, you know, it's, it's real and, you know, you know Jen, to, they've already said that. Right, right. But, you know, people are, are waiting to be told, um, especially, especially the general public and the skeptics. There's, there's still, there's still a, a kind of veil of, I don't know if, if I want to say plausible deniability, but, uh, you know, there's, there's still some kind of um, veil of like, you know, people want to be just directly told. And, th and then, you know, some of the scientists and skeptics that have have still backpedaled on this issue for what, whatever reason. I don't know why at this point, um, you know, because even uh, at, at the conference that we had on October 8th when Mitch Horowitz was talking, he said, you know, what is it intellectually, you know, silly or ridiculous to, to deny this issue any longer? And, and Mitch said, now right now is and that was in 2019 because right. we unidentified unidentified aerial phenomena uap which we all know that's ufos have been officially acknowledged but i think what people are really um wanting clarity on um and I, you know people that are familiar with the information can kind of assume yeah this is not this is not our technology this is not you know, uh, human technology, basically, uh, as the, as far as the, our, our civilization, as we know it, are not capable of producing this kind of technology. Um, so I think people really want the confirmation on that UAP, with great clarity, represents non-human intelligence and technology. Yeah, that, I think I think it's, it, I mean, it's one thing to say, well, there are objects, you know, technological objects like they did in June 2021, right? They're there and they've got, you know, 143 cases we can't explain. And they, this is, they got to demonstrate this, that, and the other characteristic. And they don't seem to be Russian or Chinese. There are no evidence that they're ours. So, you know, they're sort of saying it, but I think what, what you're implying and what people really want is like just a, a more, direct specific official statement that there is a non-human intelligence involved with this right yeah. it's something yeah. very declarative and something that's going to reverberate around the world and it's not just sort of be you know going around in circles when everybody knows what's at the center of the circle but you don't quite say it you know you don't quite yeah. say it i think people want to hear it said and i think people want more evidence too i think people want to know if they're going to mention 143 cases, well, maybe we want to know what some of those cases are, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I, I, you know, we have another report coming out very soon. Yeah, by Monday. Then, yeah. Probably by Monday. I've heard it's going to be delayed a few days, but I don't know. I've heard that it's going to be delayed a little bit, but I don't think yeah. by too much. And it's going to reference again uh, hundreds of cases. But the question is, will it give us any data about those cases? Will it tell us right. anything? If it's just a bunch of numbers, well, we got X number of cases. I think that frustrates people because they right. want to, how about giving us like three of them, you know, or something like that. Yeah. So I think people want more. And of course they want to know whether we have physical materials or crash retrievals. Yeah. So they want more physical, they want more specific data. And I think they want a, a, a kind of a stronger acknowledgement. 
that yeah. of what's real, of what's known. Um, and yeah, and I don't think that's something any officials really want to give. You know, they just don't want to, and they're not, they're probably going to try to avoid it as much as they can. And they might be forced to at some point, or they, the reality of this might be forced to a new level by all kinds of things that could happen that's beyond the control of the people who are trying to control it. Yeah, that's you know? a very important point. And I, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, the way I feel at this point is like, it's, 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 it's going to come out like, you know, it's, th there's just too much momentum behind it. There's too many things that are good that could potentially happen, uh, especially with the new language and they're asking for the NDAs, um, the non-disclosure agreements, which have information on them, right. That could be verified, tracked, traced. And that could be in the hands of, of Congress or that or it could be in the hands of the new um, the new yeah. initiative. I mean, there it was arrow. They're changing uh, the name again. Uh, they're changing the name for semantical issues so they can co collect the data that they need to. Exactly. Um, so you know, again, I'm optimistic that the, the people that are trying to create transparent transparency on this issue are making the right moves and they're quickly learning, you know, how, how to do it. So I'm optimistic in that regard. Yeah. I just think we, I think it takes a lot of patience for those of us who already know so much about this and we've been waiting and waiting, you know, but we also have to reflect on how much has happened. If you look back at the pre 2017, I mean, I operated in that world for 17 years. And to me, it's like night and day. Yeah. What's happened? you know, there's a line between 2017 before and after. And I think it's important to reflect, you know, on just these five years, how much has happened. And it just has to happen in stages. Yeah. So, but it, it, it also takes patience. Um, yeah, because any kind of process like this, I mean, if you know the government, I mean, if you know the DMV, right? Go, go it takes time. <laughs> it takes yeah. time to do this stuff. There's a lot, because there's other stuff going on in the world too. You know, of even course. though us, this stuff is like essential, this is like so important, right. but there's other stuff going on that is important. Um, this is not central to most other, you know, most members of Congress. This is not the absolute top of their list. I mean, maybe some of them feel that way on a personal level, but no, imagine what they've got to deal with. Yeah. So, you know, and it's, but it's not just a bureaucratic thing. I think it's also just the impact that this has. It, it, you know, you don't want to shock the world. It's just, it's gradual acclimation, I think is important. Yeah. And I think even um, you know, Christopher Mellon, who's also going to be at the conference on December 3rd, had mentioned that. And I think it was fascinating. He told that story about, you know, there's a group of 60 people and they um, were, did a think tank process and, and decided, you know, is this okay to put out to the public? And unfortunately, at that time, they decided this is probably not a good idea for <laughs> uh, reasons. And again, I don't, I don't think it's with ill will they made that decision. I just, oh, you know, I, I mean, this yeah. is. Yeah, no, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say this is this is a, a transformative thing, and who wants to be sitting in the seat when we're like, okay, we have to redo everything now, you know, and uh, at least to the extent where it's like. It's it's a difficult issue to talk about publicly, I guess, considering the the, the last eighty years of, of everything that's gone on, and how are you going to tell people otherwise now? You know. Yeah, it's tough, and it's an existential issue too. I mean, there are still lots of people who have clearances and know really know a lot about what's going on who believe it is not a good idea for everybody right. to know about this because there's a lot of frightening elements to it. And so, yeah, I was interested to find that out in the last year. I've talked to a bunch of people who have said they don't think it's a good idea. So even though, you know, they understand why they understand, they're not like people who are on the wrong side of anything. You know, they're just good people who um, we all know, you know, and who have a lot of insight and understand the power that this could have um, over just fears and you know existential shift of paradigm for people it's not an easy thing to go through for we're, so you know you know amongst those people was was that kind of like their main issue 
that uh, I would just say when I ask them, when I ask them about it, you know, they might think, you know, that it's just not a good idea. I mean, Jim Semivan has said as much in interviews, I believe. Yeah. You know, but that's the weird thing, though, because he's kind of he's kind of out talking about it at the same time. I know. Kind of, kind well, of saying like, the these are not people who are like keeping secrets, but at the same time, they recognize the implications that this could have and the danger of it. Yeah. But not that many people listen to a, a podcast with him, so I don't think he feels like he's taking any big risk in, and they're not necessarily going to believe him. I mean, we're talking about an official government, you know nationally internationally recognized world changing kind of statement that that might be made you know something like that um that's the kind of thing that could really be radical but i think coming coming small steps the way we've been doing it is maybe won't have any kind of devastating effect it's just it's a matter and also it's a matter of if the phenomenon does something itself right to force it, force it the reality on us we don't know if that might happen it could happen any day. I mean, if we had a Phoenix Lights in this day and age, forget it. Um, it would be captured it. on video, a lot of videos. Yeah. You know, it's exactly right. So, you know, there's that. And then there's maybe whistleblowers that will come forward without going through the, the process. I mean, I really hope that doesn't happen because I think that could set back everything. Yeah. I mean, if you have the, the, the official, uh, a part of the official world rolling with this, and they have their methodology laid out and somebody jumps outside of that and just blabs, you know, it's going to make them pull back. Yeah. So I don't think it's to anyone's advantage for, you know, rogue people, rogue whistleblowers to come jumping out and try to bypass the system. Um, I just think that we've got to keep that system going in the way it is because it's been moving forward and people like Chris and Lou have done so much work to make that happen. And they still are, they're still influencing everything. We have good people who are influencing the process. So I think it's really, I hope that everyone will cooperate with that because I think in the long run, we're going to benefit yeah, much and, more you know, yeah, people and, jumping out and talking who can't really back up what they're saying. And they haven't been through the official process yet and got the sun in my face. I don't know if it looks weird. There we go. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's, that's just how I look at it. Um, I'm glad that there is a process being set up and the legislation yeah, and, is the beginning of that but, you know yeah and you know even people like dr gary nolan wrote a a paper for uh one of the committees in explaining why it's important and it could create a virtuous cycle for this information to start coming out and and you know possibly getting other like academics like himself involved i mean i think he's a proof you know, like proof of concept that you can have an academic involved in this issue and and it could help the issue. So I, so I much think that academic is so important, James. I mean, the yes. other person is Jeffrey Kripal from Rice University, who's yeah. going to be at our conference also. And I'm so glad he is because he's been doing tremendous work in bringing the academic world into this. And not yes. to many people, I think, in the UFO community are really aware of his work. And he's I, yeah. just a phenomenal human being, brilliant. And he's been putting out these books for years and years about the reality of anomalous experience and how yeah. much that's who we are as human beings and how much the academy needs to incorporate that into the humanities. Um, and, and so anyway, I'm, I'm really, yeah, I mean, I think Gary Nolan, he's, he's in the scientific world and Jeff is in the world of the humanities and he's a professor of religion. So I just think these people are so important in kind of pulling it into the war. I think that the scientists and the academics have had a harder time. They've been a little bit behind the the military and the political world on this. And so, yeah, the, the, the academy, there are more and more people from the academic world becoming involved. And I think Jeff's one of the reasons for that. And it, same with scientists. We've got Avi Loeb, you know, doing his thing with Galileo. So yeah, I, I really, I'm so excited that Jeff Kripal is going to be in New York at that conference. Um, and he, I think he's going to be the opening speaker. And I just yeah. recommend to everybody to watch Jeff's talk, really. Yeah. Um, Jeff is incredible. And, you know, obviously um, she's not going to be there, but Diana Pasolko is another incredible academic that's been involved and, they, and done fantastic yeah. work. 
And, um, but yeah, Jeff, I, I actually had him on here a few days ago and I, I was joking with him and saying, you know, I th- it's, it's, it's a shame that the, the larger UFO community isn't as aware of his work as I think they should be. And I said, I think he goes under the radar for going over people's heads sometimes. Uh, but he doesn't in his talks, he'll, he'll be very accessible. Yeah. Yeah. He's and but he's he's so, yeah, he's so gentle and, and clear. And I think he puts things in a great perspective. He's a great communicator and professor. So I, I'm honored that he's going to be attending the event and we're going to get, I'm going to be able to meet him. And, you know, with everybody else there is going to be able to meet him and maybe say hello. And, you know, he's done incredible work and, I, you know, people know at this point, like, you know, he, he's involved with the Esalen and, and, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of one of those things, if you know, you know, uh, some of the, the meetings that go on there and, and the, the forward kind of thinking that's involved and, and the network that's involved with all that. So uh, that's, that's the also going to be cool. The archives of the impossible at, at Rice. Oh my God. Yeah. And he that said, there's going to be another one. Thing. Yeah. What's that? He said there's going to be another, there's the archives of the impossible um, from that event is going to continue out now. And Mm -hmm. uh, so they're going to have another one, I believe. Yeah. So I don't mean just the conference. I mean, the archives themselves. Right. The fact that they set that up and, you know, all the, all the communion letters from Whitley Strieber's after came in after communion, thousands of them are there. Yeah. And And every single one from an experiencer who, had never written a letter before, you know, and they never talked about it. And, and, and all, it's just other, a, a lot of people are donating the Jacques Vallée's collection is there. I mean, it's just a fam- an amazing resource and it's because of Jeff that that exists. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Really and cool. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm somebody who's very excited, um, you know, and I, I don't want to put it in like so much like a, of a UFO guy term, but for, for the, the release or the reveal of Jacques Vallée's archive. Um, Cause I, I've caught wind of some of the stuff that's in there and he's even mentioned it in, in some of his forbidden science journals. Mm-hmm. Some of the stuff that's potentially in there is, is incredible. Um, <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to what might be in there. And I mean, again, but the, the whole archive is, a really important initiative. And I think it is a, a kind of a sign of things to come and, and thanks to everybody who's involved in that whole process. Because again, that's, it's, it's, it's kind of like an indicator of how far we've come. Exactly. And the fact that it could happen at a prestigious university like Rice. Yeah. I mean, Rice University has just been on the forefront of so much great stuff. So, yeah. And, you know, Leslie, I, there's, there's actually so much more I wanted to, to get into it with you today, but we're, I think we're kind of at our, our limit right now. We both have got to do some things. Um, so, okay. I, you know, I'd, I'd love to talk to you again sometime because I wanted to get into your book, Surviving Death and, and Near Death Experiences and, and um, that and the whole issue of consciousness, because actually I've had personal experiences with that kind of stuff. And, and in, in my experience, it, it does correlate with um, the UFO issue. Um, and because, I mean, I, I say that from personal experience and it's, it's almost mind boggling how, how all of that could come together. Um, because, you know, if you didn't know any better and you didn't do research on the surface, it seems, it seems like it's just disjointed or just different topics. But there is, as, as my friend Exo Academian uh, who was at our last conference would say, you know, there's a point of convergence. Um, and that's, that's what's so fascinating to explore right now. I mean, and, I'm, yeah, and, that's what I'm really interested in. And I think so many others too are interested yeah. in putting that all together and finding all those ways of connecting everything. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, 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 when I wrote my book surviving, and we'll, just be my, we'll, we'll have to end this, but when I wrote my book, Surviving Death, that came out in 2017, which deals with the kinds of near-death experiences and a lot of other evidence for survival of past physical death, I thought of it as something completely separate from UFOs. You know, it was like, okay, I'm moving into this new topic now and had nothing to do with UFOs. And I remember saying that to people. And now I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. They're all connected. So it's really yeah. been a learning experience for me. It took me a while, to, even though I had read Jacques Vallée and stuff, you know, who was really at the forefront of, of seeing it, seeing things like this. 
seeing that kind of bigger, broader perspective of what the UFO actually is, um, you know, I, I learned a lot from that starting in 2017. It has been a, yeah. a process for me to learn more and more about what a UAP really means and how it connects to consciousness and the afterlife and all of it and how mysterious all of that is, how much we don't understand about it. Um, so that's really fascinating. Right. And it gets it gets right into the nature of reality. I mean, the deep I and mean, that, that's as deep as it goes, really. And again, you know, Jeffrey Kripal and Whitley Strieber um, have been important in that kind of conversation as well. And right. um, also at the conference, uh, Sharon Hewitt um, Rowlett, who Let's was who participated awesome. in, in the BICS, the uh, Bigelow right. Institute for Consciousness Studies, is, is going to be at the conference. Um, and I think that's going to be really great for to tie in, especially, you know, with you, who you and Ralph participated in the New York Times article and, and Christopher Mellon, who's going to be there, participated in the way that he did and getting the tapes out of the Pentagon, you know, God bless him. Um, so I, yeah, I think that's really incredible. It's a broad spectrum of people who are going to be at this conference. That's what I love about it. They were bringing together. You know, everyone from Chris Mellon to Whitley Strieber, right? Those, they're really yeah. at different ends of the spectrum of, of how how they dwell in the UFO reality. And um, and then you've got the academics there who look at it. They have another perspective. And, it, you know, how does it all come together? I just think it's it's really fascinating. So yeah. can't wait. Yeah, can't well, wait to speakers at this event. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. And I, yeah, it's going to be amazing. So, you know, thank you so much, Leslie, for, for joining us today. Um, I Having definitely you. want to speak again soon. I'll be seeing you soon. Um, yeah, just, definitely. But just one more thing. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Um, any, I know, I know that's like, it's like, oh my God, wait. Um, any, anything you'd want to impart to the audience about, you know, the UFO topic or even consciousness or. Oh my anything. God. <laughs> I don't. I can't think of anything, James. Right. Um, yeah, I feel like you're putting That's me on. Fine. No. Um. I mean, I'm. I'm learning. Yeah. With respect to the UFO and consciousness question, I mean, I mean, we can all think of examples of the connection between the two, and you know how it impacts consciousness, and consciousness impacts it, and how right. people's consciousness is affected after they see a UFO, and it opens up all kinds of clairvoyance and telepathy and. I mean, you know, what does that all mean? How is that, you know, and, and then the work of Gary Nolan is in there where he's looking at the, the brain activity and the brain function of people that have anomalous experiences. And it's just like this universe of sort of interesting things that we all kind of know about, but we haven't found that sort of core center for the whole thing. And I yeah. don't know if we will, right? Right. right. Never will. It's a big mystery. Yeah. So I don't really feel like I'm in a position to offer any important <laughs> words to anybody. Well, you, you already have. So thank you so much, <laughs> Leslie. And um, it's, it's going to be great seeing you in person and, 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 and talking to you again. So I'll great. speak to you soon. Okay, James. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.